This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White for the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm your host this afternoon. And in the conference room at the Mississippi Arts Commission on the 11th floor of the Wolf Oak State Office Building. I have as my guests Paul Fayard and Ron Lindsay. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us here today. Paul Fayard is a Mississippi-based artist and art educator. He's originally from New Orleans. Paul studied at the New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts, the University of New Orleans, and Mississippi College, where he received the Master's of Fine Art degree, fine arts degree. For many years, he was a counselor in the mental health industry, uh, but now Paul works at Wolf Studios as a ceramicist. That is correct, sir. (laughs) And you both show at the Attic Gallery in Vicksburg. That's also true. My second guest is Ron Lindsay, born in Meridian, Mississippi, which I didn't know. Yes. This is information that I'm happy to know. (laughs) He grew up in Union and Clinton, Mississippi, and he received a degree in art from Mississippi College also. He studied and worked with the infamous, very famous Carl and Mildred (laughs) Wolf for several years, which is quite an achievement. Yes. He taught at Jackson Public Schools for 14 years, and he recently retired from a stint teaching at the Mississippi State Hospital. Ron, if we could, tell us about teaching at the Mississippi State Hospital. That sounds fascinating. That was a wonderful experience, and it was very fulfilling. It was different from just uh, being alone by yourself, painting in the studio, interacting with very interesting people. Um, The great thing about it is that once a year we would have a um, show called Serendipity, which would feature the patient's artwork and uh, they would get to see their work framed and up for sale, and it was great for their self-esteem and pretty good for mine. Yeah, that sounds like a fabulous... You worked with my sister-in-law, Ann White, out there. The lovely Ann White. That's right, just saw her recently. Now, Paul, uh, you were born and raised in New Orleans. When did you come to Mississippi, and how did you end up here? Um, I came to Mississippi... I guess it's been about 30 years ago now. I can't believe it's been that long. But uh, my ex-wife and I moved, and we actually moved to Crystal Springs, and I lived there for quite some time before uh, moving to Clinton. So I actually moved also to uh, attend school at Mississippi College because my ex-wife was also an instructor there. So that worked out. And you guys are... um half of the Clinton Four, a notorious group of painters that uh, gather from time to time in Clinton. Yes. Every Sunday. The Geezer Coffee Clatch, we like to call it. Also, membership, uh, in the membership is Wyatt Waters. Yes. And Sam Beavers. Correct. And how did this begin? And tell us a little bit about your group. Well, I must say that Wyatt and I were the uh, founding members, and we used to meet for coffee we, for uh, practically every day back in the 30 years ago. And then Sam and Paul came into the group, and um, we have a Sunday morning um, coffee, at, and we meet generally at uh, either Cups and Clinton or Sam Beaver's house lately, and we bring paintings to critique, and I'd say we're pretty gentle on each other as far as the critiques go. Um, Paul, do you got anything to add to that? Um, well, we all live in Clinton, so it's yes. very convenient You all live us. there, so yes, we do. Yes. thus the Clinton Four. Yes, all within a stone's throw of each other, practically. Um, and it's great to uh, have the camaraderie of fellow artists because uh, generally, you know, we're painting alone in our studios or out in the field. Yes. And uh, it is nice to get some feedback and critique when necessary. And so uh, we definitely take advantage of that. Now, did you all four attend Mississippi College as well? Did Sam attend Mississippi? Yes. yes, we all four did. 
We all studied under Sam Gore. I was going to ask you yeah. who you studied under. Yeah, uh-huh. I assumed so it would be Dr. Another Gore. thing that we all have in common. Yeah. That's correct. And how long uh, have you been working, Paul, at the, at the Wolf Studios, the famous Wolf Studios? Been working at Wolf Studios for, gee, uh, I'd say nine, maybe ten years now. And uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, thoroughly I work there uh, part-time and the rest of the time I spend painting so. and and the times that I've uh, gone by the the gallery there to purchase fabulous little I won't call them widgets because that's what Walter Anderson's family call theirs right what do you call the little figurines and well, birds? birds but I we have more birds. than birds we have uh, a- all kinds of animals and BB uh, wolf who is Carl and Mildred's daughter is running the show out there along with her husband David and doing a fabulous job and uh, so we have a little something for everybody. I would say the Wolf Studio must be one of the oldest creative businesses in certainly in the Jackson area maybe in the state I don't since know. Since the 40s I think. Yeah. yeah. You know I've, I've always so. found it interesting Ron that you know the Andersons created the widgets so that they could have something to sell so that they could be free to paint and I assume that the wolves did the same sort of thing and they could sell yes. the birds and then they could work on their portraits and their landscapes and, and the rest. Yes, Mildred said that a painting is hard to sell and the ceramics, you know, they called them grocery money sometimes. <laughs> they bloomed into something a lot bigger than that with under BB's tutelage. So, um, I worked there, I went there when I was 17 years old, in, uh, and I framed, I would go leaf um, Carl's frames, and I would work in the ceramic, work on the ceramics, and I uh, just learned a tremendous amount of, from them, just through osmosis and from um, just being around them. Art history, the one wonderful thing in 1972, when I was 20, that's amazingly 50 years ago. Um, my great friend Wayne Harrison and I decided to go on a three-month trek of uh, Europe uh, backpack thing, and Carl and Mildred each both uh, wrote me a letter telling me of every great piece of art in Europe that I should see. Gosh. And uh, that was the world's greatest art history lesson, and we even made it down to Morocco where we stayed. Sergio Fernandez's parents were living in Morocco, and we stayed with them a while. Mm. And the color in Morocco was just amazing but I owe, um, I owe the world to Carl and Mildred Wolf for what they taught me. That's interesting uh, I did not know Sergio's parents uh, lived in Morocco I got to visit Morocco once and oh, yeah. it's a remarkable country. Truly. Uh, uh, you're listening to the Arts Hour I'm Malcolm White um, here as a substitute host for the Arts Hour I in- enjoyed being here on the air on Sunday afternoons for many years but today my guests are Paul Fayard and Ron Lindsay, both remarkable uh, artists who live and work in Mississippi and have done so for a very long time. But, Paul, you started out um, in New Orleans, and I know I own several pieces of, of your art. And, and thank Ron, you for that. I own yes, several thank you. pieces of yours. I keep waiting for those oysters that you're yes. going to paint me. Still this, life is, of oysters. this has been an ongoing joke now for it almost has. 30 years. Yes, it has been. <laughs> But, Paul, uh, a lot of your influences uh, are New Orleans. You, you paint down there probably as much as you paint in Mississippi, don't you? Um, I do. I like to travel back and forth. In fact, I just uh, went in uh, two days ago to uh, drop off a couple of paintings. But, um, yeah, I'm really – it's the architecture of New Orleans and just the character. And, and actually, that's some of the architecture and character that we find in Vicksburg as well. And that's where Ron likes to paint. And Ron mm-hmm. and I have gone painting uh, several times. And we both show at the Attic Gallery in Vicksburg. And uh, it's uh, got a lot of color, uh, a lot of character, and um, definitely elevation. drawn to that. Lots yeah. of elevation in, uh, in Vicksburg, along with color and character. Come for the color, stay for the elevation. You know, <laughs> Ron, you've painted so much in Vicksburg. I used to think you were from Vicksburg. I, I, well, my very first show was at the Attic Gallery, and it was um, the first, at the opening, nothing sold, but in, within a week, everything had sold. So I went with that. I, would, I, I made many trips over to Vicksburg 
and painted outdoors many times, and so I um, have a real fondness for the place. Let's talk about the Attic Gallery. You both show there. It's a historic, uh, primarily folk art gallery, but she, uh, Leslie shows and sells art other than folk. I would not classify either of you as folk artists, but mm -hmm. what do I know? Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about Leslie and the shop there uh, in Vicksburg, a remarkable place. Remarkable, and Leslie's a, a great supporter of the arts, uh, recipient of the Governor's Award, and uh, uh, really kind to artists throughout the years, and uh, happy to show there. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary. I know, I was so impressed. It's that pretty for, amazing. For an, a creative entre enterprise like an art gallery in Mississippi yes, the last 50 exactly. years on the corner in Vicksburg, I guess she's always been in that same location. Or oh, they were a little a further up the street, on, still on Washington Street, but they were a few blocks up the street. But she's a real uplifting person. She, I can be down in the dumps and talk to Leslie, and I'm, my spirits are lifted. And she does that, I think, for all artists. She's an icon in the art world in Mississippi, and she deserves any and all accolades that might come her way. I, I love going to Vicksburg and going downstairs to the Highway 61 coffee shop. Yep, and Andy Boone. Andy Boone, and then going upstairs and just getting lost is the best yep. way I can describe an afternoon at the yep. Attic Gallery. The more you look, the more you see. <laughs> and it goes on and on and yes, on. Yes, it does. So, uh, Paul... Uh, Describe yourself for us, for listeners who might not be familiar with your work. I have mentioned that you're a painter and a ceramicist, but describe your work. Um, well, I'm mostly, I'd have to say, uh, very much interested in uh, mostly sunlight, but just the effects of sunlight on buildings. Uh, you know, there's a famous quote by Edward Hopper, who, of course, I'm a fan of, I'm amongst many other people, but... Uh, Edward Hopper said, all I ever wanted to do was paint sunlight on the side of a house. And uh, I feel like that a lot of times because, uh, um, you know, there's just a beauty to that. And especially when it's on beautiful architecture, it makes me feel good to paint them. And hopefully that is um, transported, transpired through the painting. And uh, the, my collectors get to enjoy that as well. So that's it's very therapeutic for me as well. I would recommend painting to anybody, to everybody, uh, whether you're a professional painter or not, or if not painting something that you have control over, that you are uh, the sole creator of, the sole uh, person responsible for, and uh, it's a great uh, learning experience and it's a very meditative uh, experience as well. And you're both teachers, so you, you, you see this from both sides, right? Yeah, I, I enjoy teaching. I, I taught for uh, about five years. I taught at Mississippi College and Jackson State, um, and I really enjoyed that time. And it, it definitely, uh, teaching others uh, forces you to kind of uh, uh, synthesize all your knowledge and, and helps you to understand, you know, why you're doing what you are doing. So I enjoyed that. I'm not teaching currently, but uh, hope to one day perhaps soon. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Arts Hour. Malcolm White for the Mississippi Arts Commission. We're glad you have tuned in to the Arts Hour. My guests today are Paul Fayard and Ron Lindsay, both very accomplished painters uh, who live and work in the Jackson area. 
actually they live in Clinton, uh, which is uh, a suburb of Jackson, I suppose, the home of Mississippi College, where both of you gentlemen uh, studied and have degrees. But Ron, before the break, I was asking Paul to sort of describe his work and what he does, and I would ask you if you wouldn't mind to do that for listeners who may not be familiar with Ron Lindsay's painting. Okay, I'll try, but I loved um, Paul's comment about sunlight on houses and the side of houses, and that's something that has intrigued me for many years. I also uh, enjoy painting still lifes. At one point, I in the 80s, I found this painter named David Bates uh, who intrigued me, and he, he used st uh, folk art objects in his paintings and painted in a deliberately naive style. And I thought by collecting folk art objects and using them in my still lifes, I would magically turn into David Bates, which uh, is a strange thought. But it led me to Mexico, where I found looking for those objects to use in my still lifes. And uh, I fell in love with Mexico. The color, my color brightened and um, the, my, the, my textures, they, a lot of Mexican painters use sand in their painting and I tried that too. But I, I think I owe a lot to Mildred Wolf who thought, who said that every square inch of the painting should be interesting. And so I mm -hmm. led me to lots of underpainting, uh, lots of overpainting, and, and then I would sand with an electric sander to reveal those surfaces. So my, I think largely my paintings are, are largely, have largely textured surfaces. Yeah. You know, I own one painting of yours that I think you told me was a cigarette package called Payosos. Yes, that was a Guatemala. I went to Guatemala and that was a Guatemalan cigarette, pay, Payosos. It payosos. means clown. Yeah, it's a clown. It's right. a clown. It scares a lot of people. Very um, <laughs> <yeah. Scary> clowns. <laughs> Now, one of the paintings, uh, Paul, that I know you've just completed because I follow you on social media, uh, is a portrait of Ron. That is correct, sir. <laughs> In fact, I've painted Ron probably more than anybody, oddly enough. Oddly, oddly indeed. Uh, but this was, uh, I was visiting Ron over at his house, and he got a dog, and I've been encouraging him for a long time to get a little four-legged companion <laughs> and his sister uh, finally uh, found him a perfect match and uh, I was over there um, recently and I asked him if I could take a, a photo reference of Chappie and uh, a Boston Terrier a Boston Terrier very <laughs> handsome chap and he did so and I said I have to do something with this so I, I did a little painting of uh, Ron and Chappie sitting on the sofa. Hmm. And I'm sure the public gobbled it up quickly. Everybody loves Ron, and That's they love <laughs> Chappie even more. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big seller. Yes. <laughs> Can't go wrong. No. So you both studied uh, under Dr. Gore at, at Mississippi College. I wondered if, Ron, you would start and talk a little bit about Dr. Gore or, or just being a student at Mississippi College, MC as we say locally. Yes, well, actually, the Wolfs pointed me there and, and, you know, had high praise for Sam Gore. And he uh, was a, uh, he scared me a little, but he was, of course, very nice and avuncular, if I can use that word. Please. <laughs> and um, he stressed that I should have more conviction in my drawing. And I took drawing from him, and uh, he was right. And, um, I gained a lot of knowledge from him, and I took sculpture also, and took lots of ceramic classes. But Dr. Gore was um, a, a great and inspiring figure to be hang around. Yes, he was. You know, I just occurred to me that I own a piece of of your ceramic work called Hot Fish. Right, I remember that. That was a uh, pit fired place. I, I was a, it has um, fired in uh, sawdust. It gives it the black patina. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you. I, I cherish it. And Paul, talk a little bit about your studying under Dr. Gore and at MC. Um, I enjoyed studying with Dr. Gore, and I remember one of the best lessons I learned from him was he said, you should never treat your artwork as something precious. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told a story about a, a guy he went to school with who in, was a ceramicist and had made a whole lot of pots. 
And long story, semi-long, <laughs> the instructor broke all of his pots, mm. and the guy was crushed. And uh, he actually, according to Dr. Gore, he dropped out. Of, he, he gave up on being an artist after that. My but the, the takeaway that Dr. Gore had was that, you know, our work is an expression, and as that, it's in flux. And so you should never, um, you know, um, who is it, Truman Compote, he said, kill your darlings. Well, this is kind of the opposite of that. It's like don't, don't see your darlings as darlings, and you should always um, be willing to take a risk, I guess, is, mm -hmm. a, is to make your work better rather than being afraid right. and, uh, you know, approaching it with fear. So there's a great book called Art and Fear. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, it, uh, you definitely got to face your fears when you're creating art because you, you're, you're putting yourself out there and uh, you're taking chances. And that's what's uh, really is so beautiful about it because it's always something new no matter what. I'll never get tired of painting. Ron, uh, Clinton, I find Clinton to be a paradoxical place, uh, a place where there is a university and people like the two of you have studied in a town that produced Barry Hanna, for goodness sakes. Right. Uh, and I think, uh, I was trying to think of who else. Of course, Wyatt went to school there. And, mm -hmm. um, Dunlap, I think, maybe studied there. But anyway, talk yes. a little bit about uh, Clinton and, and, and your choice and your decision to, to, to land there. Well, I landed there in 62 when I was 10 years old. My father, I'm a Baptist preacher's kid. And so we moved uh, from Union uh, to there. And... Um, uh, I've ended up living in the, the same house. I've been lots of places, but I'm back to Clinton and living in the same house that I m moved to in 1962. The house you grew up in? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And so um, it just strangely has become a bit of an art mecca. And um, uh, so the fact that Wyatt and Paul and Sam and I are there, uh, hopefully we improve things a bit. And the town is seems to be really uh, growing and uh, expounding, and there are more restaurants, and there yes. seems to be more of a, uh, a community. I mean, there's festivals, there's all sorts of goings on uh, there in the city and the town. And oh yeah, seems to be on the on the up and up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my fiance Sarah Wolf and I live in Old Town, and we love to walk around. We go out to the track. We pretty much walk every day, but it's a beautiful. Beautiful town, and we enjoy living there. I actually lived there very briefly in the uh, 70s. My mm. father took a, a post with uh, then-Governor Bill Waller as the state and federal coordinator for the state of Mississippi, and uh, my parents bought a, a home there in Clinton, and uh, I briefly was there uh, with them. And, and about the only thing I could figure out to do, I'd walk every day when my mm little brother was at school i would go over to the campus and walk around the campus right. oh, and just beautiful campus poke around and yeah. in old town you're listening to the arts hour i'm malcolm white i'm a substitute uh host today for the arts commission i'm happy to be here in the conference room uh, of the arts commission up on the 11th floor uh, of the wolf oak office building overlooking the fabulous new capital uh, in the distance. My guests today are Paul Fayard and Ron Lindsay, two painters that I admire very much, and I am fortunate to have collected uh, some of each of your work. And Paul, I, I think the pieces of yours I own are both New Orleans pieces, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, I'm, I'm quite sure they're all New Orleans. One is Mandina's, I think. That's right, Mandina's Restaurant. Talk about Mandina's Restaurant. Uh, I love that's that That's Sarah and I's favorite, one of our favorite uh, restaurants in New Orleans or anywhere really but uh, uh, classic uh, New Orleans uh, cuisine can't get enough of it I recently saw an episode of um, John T edges program on ESPN um, called something true north or something like that but anyway he did a whole episode on Mandina's and the family and what it's happened. It's a survivor, yeah. Yeah, during Katrina. Yep. And you then, can see the watermarks on the wall there. Right. They have them logged off, but uh, they survived. Yeah, and it's going going strong. Yep. Great restaurant. 
New Orleans is all about survival, for sure. But you love to paint uh, the architecture of New Orleans, and, and I think surely pe- most people, uh, I would think, would be attracted to that, as most people feel some connection to the Crescent City. Yeah, I, I do. I paint uh, portraits um, and uh, other things, too, of course. But uh, the architecture, to me, um, I guess just a feeling of place and a feeling of home. So it might not be a home that you are familiar with, but you still get that feeling of home, and that's what attracts me to to that. Uh, um, as a kid, I uh, went through Hurricane Betsy. Oh, yeah. And uh, during Hurricane Betsy, the water came right up to our house on Pauline Street, right up to the to the uh, edge of the porch. And uh, ever since then, uh, I guess I've had a... Um, uh, I've appreciated the uh, the boat like quality of New Orleans shotgun <laughs> houses right. and surviving uh, on the ark, so to speak. So that's part of it too. And Ron, you paint a lot of architectural uh, pieces too, but they're mostly, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, rural Mississippi. Would that be a good way to describe it? Yes, I think some people call them vernacular architecture, but that's right. Uh, uh, they're Usually they're more colorful than, I mean, I've never been attracted to painting an antebellum mansion or anything like that. People seem to suggest that to me sometimes, but um, it's not not my thing. Uh, I'm also uh, attracted to the color of Mexico. I love going to Mexico and just hanging out there. I went there um, a couple of years ago and stayed for two months. So that... um, I don't paint architecture down there so much as, as I said, um, the objects from there. But uh, I get a lot of osmosis in uh, Mexico. Right. And do the two of you ever actually go out and paint together? Do you both paint on location? We do. Um, And we have. Actually, all four, the the Clinton four have been painting in Vicksburg together. That's usually where we go, yes. Wow. (laughs) We're, We're due. Now, Wyatt is out and about. <clears throat> traveling, working on some sort of a book project. As he's I in Florida right now. Yes. Okay. And it's sort of a, he's painting the southeast. Do I have that right, Ron? Yes. It's going to be called the Watercolor Road, and he's painting painting the southeast, and doing a beautiful job. Now, Wyatt, uh, has his work's been published quite a bit. Do either of you aspire to have books published, or do you just like painting and uh, selling the pieces and moving on? We all aspire to be more like white, <laughs> <laughs> work-wise and otherwise. I would love to have a book. Um, sure. One day. Mm-hmm. So that's that's on the to, to-do list still. Yes. And Paul? Oh, yeah. Is that something that interests oh, you? Oh, definitely. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Um, in fact, uh, I've been working on having my a lot of my work uh, professionally photographed, uh, and to the end of having a book, but also of uh, having uh, fine art prints, which I hope to have available soon on my website. Wow, very good. Why don't you go ahead and share your website while we're talking about sure. it? Sure, uh, I'd love for you to check it out. It's paulfayard.com, and I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, both Ron and I show at the Attic Gallery in Vicksburg, and uh, I also show at the Karen Gallery in Tupelo and the new Karen Gallery, Karen Gallery South, that uh, is opening up in Laurel, Mississippi. I saw that. And, just uh, like very last exciting. week. Yep. Uh, very exciting. And uh, they're just, I think they're going to open up on Monday as, as their, um, their first day. So I'm looking forward to getting some work out there. And I also show at Oxford Treehouse Gallery in uh, Oxford, Mississippi, with the lovely Vivian Neal. Yeah, that, that's great. And Ron, beyond the attic, where might people find your work? At your house? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sort of techno-challenged. I do not have a website. Uh, but, um, yes, the attic gallery uh, is where you'll find me. Mm-hmm. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app.
I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Arts Hour. Malcolm White, your host today in the studio, which is actually today located in the conference room at the Mississippi Arts Commission. I know I talk a lot about that, but, uh, you know, normally we're at MPB in the studios, so it's kind of interesting and different. My guests today, Paul Fayard and Ron Lindsay, two of the notorious and famous Clinton Four, painters of Clinton, Wyatt Waters and Sam Beavers being the other Two members, and gentlemen, I thought that we would start the third segment talking a little bit about your influences, and Paul, if you wouldn't mind, you go first. Um, I'd love to. Um, I remember when I first met Ron, he, um, I think we were, I'm trying to think exactly when it was, but we both used to go to Wells yes. Church, mm-hmm. and uh, some kind of way, I found out that this guy was a painter, And not only was he a painter, but he painted similarly to the way I did at the time, and still do, actually, with uh, uh, underpainting, a bright underpainting. I thought I invented it, but apparently not. (laughs) Um, And Ron was uh, very generous with his uh, vast knowledge of art, and he shared with me Richard Diebenkorn book, who I was familiar with, but I never had seen all of his works uh, collected in a book before, and I've that's just one of the influences that we have share in common. And uh, I was just mentioning that Ron actually uh, wrote to Richard Deven Korn. You yes. want to tell him the story, Ron? Well, if you don't know, he was one of the premier California painter, figurative painters and abstract painters, sort of a second tier abstract expressionist. And I have a tendency to write letters or to famous people and sometimes getting responses. And uh, I sent him a a sort of a fawning fan letter and lo and behold, he wrote me back and sent a catalog to me from one of his uh, shows at Nodler in New York. And I was just blown away. And a few years later, when Eudora Welty came out with one writer's beginning, I sent him a copy, a signed copy of that. And he he wrote me a letter that time and uh, and sent me a book of his work. And, he was just uh, a really considerate man. And I, I treasure those letters and catalogs that he sent me. And what would his style be if, if you were to, I mean, you know, people love to categorize art styles. How would you categorize? Uh, I would say, well, the one thing that I think we both admire about uh, Richard Diebenkorn is that he sort of bucked the trend. Uh, he was started out being an abstract artist, more or less, and when the trend became more figurative, he did the reverse. And... Uh, Another thing that he had was a uh, beautiful use of color and I would say uh, a purposeful sort of crudity to his work, uh, yes. which I would say exaggerates the painterly quality of it. And also it just gives it a characteristic that you really appreciate uh, and especially in person, you know, and, uh, and also layers of paint, I would say. And he would let his mistakes show sometimes. Right, yeah. Sort of a, he was very influenced by Matisse. Lots of very loose uh, brushwork, and that's something I strive for. We all strive for looseness, but it's hard to achieve. You're taught strictness, but you strive for looseness. Correct. Is that- well, I, and I think somebody, a um, patron of mine, asked, uh, well, described one of my pieces uh, to me, and I, she said, uh, well, it looks like it all just happened at once. Which isn't the case, of course, but uh, <laughs> that's the, what we're trying for. Yeah, that's, it's got to sit well, according to, that's one of uh, Demon Corns. Mm. Uh, it's, it has to sit well, so uh, that's what we all strive for, for sure. Sit well while it's being created, or sit well after it is created? When it's finished, it okay. has to sit well. Sit so well. whatever it takes to get to that point is, hmm. is what the artist is, is required to do. Now, Ron, talk a little bit about this underpainting. Is that where you're sanding? I I want to make sure I have the terminology right here. Well, it came from uh, some people paint on a white canvas, and then some people tone tone their canvases, and uh, it sort of evolved from that. From a toned canvas, I started 
painting particular areas under, with, un, with underpainting, bright colors, and then uh, my overpainting would tone down the whole thing. And then, as I said, I used a random orbit sander and sanded the whole surface, and you get happy accidents. After that, I would apply more oil, and sometimes oil mixed with wax medium. It's a way of uh, enriching the surface of the canvas and making, I, I want the painting to have some mystery to it. If a painting doesn't have mystery, it, it to me does not have much. So I want the surfaces to be as rich and um, interesting as possible. Do you ever work from photography or only on location or in the studio? In the from studio memory? or on location, very, very seldom do I um, use a photograph, but I, I do. But that, that was sort of a, a plain air painting and a painting from life, a still life from life, I believe is, is I mean, uh, photography is a tool, as they always say, and you can, you can get a great painting from f a photograph, but uh, I prefer, prefer to work from life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and the thing about working from life is that it helps you if you do have to work from a photograph because when you're working from life, you have a deadline. You have a, maybe a two-hour window or two-and-a-half-hour window, and so you have to make critical decisions within that period. So what's the most important thing that I'm looking at? What's, you know, get down to the essentials. Uh, Van Gogh said, uh, exaggerate the essentials, leave the obvious vague. Mm -hmm. So that painting from life uh, definitely uh, forces you to do that, and it gives you a, a, a perspective that uh, hopefully you maintain. If you do work from a photograph, you realize it's... Uh, Leave out what you don't need to say hmm. is, is actually probably the best uh, way to go. You're listening to the Arts Hour. Malcolm White, your host today, here with Ron Lindsay and Paul Fayard. And we're talking about these gentlemen's occupation, which is painting and drawing and making art. So let's talk a little bit about light. You mentioned light early. And the both of you paint plain air outside on location. So you have a couple of hours of a window you mentioned when you're painting. Is that light that you are trying to capture in that two-hour period ever repeated, or is it gone forever, and if you don't get it then, you never get it? Well, you can come back the next day at the same right. time. So it does repeat. It does repeat somewhat. But it could be cloudy or overcast. Sure, or, or and you got to be open to change. You got to go with the flow. It definitely forces you to be to change your approach if you need to. But uh, even within that two-hour period or two uh, and a half-hour period, it's going to change drastically. So uh, one of the things that it helps to do is to kind of put in your the structure of the uh, the composition, the light and dark areas, to have that kind of mapped out ahead of time, uh -huh. knowing that that's going to change and then kind of stick into a plan. So you got to have a plan. Uh, painting plan a, plain air definitely uh, makes you to have a, a method to your madness. And Ron, uh, about light, is it difficult to capture it? Do you only have a, a brief moment and it's gone, or can you come back and say, I remember exactly what this looks like and what I want to oh. do here? I usually go back several days uh, on one painting, but the last time Paul and I painted in Vicksburg, we had a we did a morning painting and an afternoon painting. Right, and uh, so that helps. And you, the light, of course, is completely different in the afternoon from a, from a start on a morning picture. So you can put it aside after the light changes, and the next day you hope to be able to you recapture. Hope. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, I I read a little bit that your first love was drawing. And I True. wondered if you yeah. would talk a little bit about drawing versus painting sure. versus, and ceramicists, um, being a ceramicist. Right. Um, uh, the famous uh, painter Ong said, uh, drawing is the probity of art. Probity mean the truthfulness, how we get to the truthfulness of art. So for me, and also an, another artist who I'm very much influenced by, uh, Degas, was a drawer and, and did a lot of work. He said, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'd work only in black and white. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot there. There's a depth there, you know. Um, but I do love to draw, uh, especially portraits uh, in, in pencil or charcoal. And uh, just, I guess, because it's so direct, you know, we all start drawing. Every kid draws. Sure. And uh, there's a great book I mentioned already, Art and Fear. And the story is a guy is an art teacher, and uh, he's telling his daughter what he does for a living. 
And uh, he says, that, well, I teach people to draw. And the daughter says, you mean they forget? <laughs> <laughs> I thought yeah. you were going to say, she said, what do you mean? They don't already all know? Well, that's exactly it, because everybody does know that. But at some point, you know, we don't, we, we p- put down the pencil because we're afraid of what our peers might say about it. And uh, some of us don't put it down. But, uh, yeah, I love drawing just for the... Uh, you know, you can do so much with so little, I guess, is the beauty of drawing. And the, the problem with drawing is, and actually that was Degas' bread and butter, was drawing, actually, not, not painting. So, uh, so the paintings became famous later or just? Well, he, was, uh, he made a living as, a, his, as an artist. And uh, he didn't, of course, he lived long enough to see his work increase dramatically and uh, at, at auctions and stuff. And he was asked about that. He said, does it make you, does it upset you? that uh, your work that you create and you sell for you know a certain price and uh, you find out later that it's that person is selling it you know for treble the price or quadruple the price and uh, his response was uh, uh, well I'm like the ra- racehorse that wins the derby I'm happy with my allotted oats uh-huh. uh, <laughs> and and I definitely feel that way if, if I can be in the studio you know all I want to do is do that uh, it's important to make a living and it, you know it's that's a good thing too but uh, you know uh, a painter is uh, above all uh, a workman I don't know it's not relaxing as people say it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard work they say oh painting must be so relaxing no it's not well it's got to be very stressful. I disagree I think it is relaxing it's Sometimes it can be anxious making before you start, but I think once you prime the pump and start doing it, then it takes you to another world. I never, it, it's like a time machine. When I was uh, making photographs, you know, we'd go in the old school photographs, developing photographs, we'd go in there and uh, go in and like you come out two more hour, two hours later or three hours later. Right. It's like, where did the time go? Right. Stop but, time. Uh, yeah, so it's the same thing with painting and uh, I do it every day and i hopefully we'll continue to do so for a long time my sweet mate down at 200 south commerce street richard kelso uh, we talk a lot and uh, he talks a lot about drawing he considers it a must it's a it's an exercise for him that nothing else can replace he is known as a painter but the drawing means everything to him and he allots x amount of time every day for drawing every week for drawing ron do you well i had a conversation with richard kelso at uh neblet's frame shop and he he just draws like a maniac after painting all day long he will come home and just draw for hours and i do not have that type of discipline or energy but uh i admire him but i've, I've got to throw in that paul is just an excellent draftsman i love his painting uh, drawings and um i like to draw in charcoal but i'd rather paint than draw I'm well, I, you prefer both. I mean, yeah. you love Richard's both. a great artist. And the thing with painting, uh, it's kind of a misnomer that uh, painting and drawing, you, in order to paint well, you have to really be a, a great draftsman because it's all about shape. So it's maybe more difficult to, uh, to get the shapes from the tip of a brush but you're essentially doing the same thing. So mm. it's actually being a good draftsman definitely helps. Uh, with uh, painting, so I would I would uh, advise any any painter to uh, work on their drawing too if they they want to improve their painting. Do you both work in watercolor? That seems to me like a runaway train. I mean, watercolor how do you, is how do you predict is where that stuff's going? a beast unto going? itself. Uh, yes. I did work in watercolor for years, and I taught a watercolor class. And uh, but it's hard to do everything well, and so you'll find that uh, if if I can do one medium well, I'm um, I'm happy. Uh, so. I mostly focus on uh, on oil painting, but you can use acrylics like uh, watercolor somewhat, and yes. I do do watercolors occasionally, and you know all the mediums are good. I'm not a watercolorist; I never have been, but I admire those who can. It's a difficult medium. Yeah, it it seems like that would be terrifying. Yeah, I've learned a lot from watching Wyatt. Speaking of being a good draftsman, because what people don't see is the incredible drawing that yes. Wyatt does. Uh, before before. Mm-hmm. he paints, and yeah. so uh, that's the secret. So talking about Wyatt Waters, and today in the studio we have had two of the Clinton Four. We have had 
Ron Lindsay and Paul Fayard and the other two members are Wyatt Waters aforementioned and Sam Beavers. Gentlemen, thank you both for coming in and sharing uh, an hour of your life. Oh, thanks so much for having us. Thank and, you. Yeah, it's it's been a real treat for me to, to sit and listen and learn, but uh, great luck to you in the future and long days of good light. Thank you. Here, thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio.